Welcome to Praxis. I'm Olivia Rousset. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our audience here in Sydney, those joining us in, on video link from Dili, Honiara and Port Moresby, as well as those watching on APAC online or listening on radio. Today we'll be discussing urbanisation in the developing world. For the first time in history, in the 21st century, the majority of humans now live in cities. By 2050, it's expected that 75% of the world's population will be urbanised. Cities are at the heart of a fast-changing global economy, generating wealth, jobs and investment across the developing world. China's shift to urbanisation has been key to its economic transformation. The Pacific, too, is mo moving towards an urban future. Around 40% of Pacific Islanders now live and work in towns. By 2025, the developing world as we understand it now will be home to 29 megacities. But with rapid urbanisation comes vast challenges. Many cities have starkly unequal standards of living and high levels of environmental damage. Globally, one in three city dwellers live in slum conditions. In Papua New Guinea, it's close to 50%. Many lack a secure home, a job, basic sanitation or safe water supply. They face increased dangers from disease, crime and pollution. The quality of life for millions of people will depend on the quality of their cities. So how can we make our cities more inclusive? What does resilient, sustainable urbanisation look like? To discuss this, on our panel we have Truman Packard, a lead economist from the World Bank, John Connell from the University of Sydney, Simon Cramp, the director of AusAid's Governance for Growth Program in Vanuatu, and Max Kep, who is the director of Papua New Guinea's Office for Urban, of Urbanisation. Truman, I'd like to start with you. Could you describe urbanisation globally? Olivia, you mentioned that critical threshold in mankind's evolution that was uh, crossed at some point in 2009 or 2010. No one really knows when it happened. Uh, but at that point, when we crossed that threshold, more people were living in cities and towns than had ever uh, done so before uh, in mankind's evolution. At about that point, the World Bank decided to dedicate its annual World Development Report to the subject of economic geography and particularly urbanization. And what it was was a marked transition, a marked shift in how policymakers and the people who advise policymakers thought about urbanization. Up until that point, there was a lot of ambiguity about it. Uh, people uh, were very, very much against migration of people from rural areas to urban centers. But in the World Development Report 2009, the World Bank made a definitive shift of being more supportive of urbanization as a way to unlock potential to economic growth and vast poverty reduction. Um, cities are the gateways of globalization. Uh, cities are the machines that turn poor people into middle class people. Um, cities are the places where serfs come to become citizens and to become more uh, politically active and hold their governments accountable. And the World Bank uh, began to reflect what is an emerging consensus that we should be supporting uh, the growth of cities and we should be supporting that as an engine of economic growth and poverty reduction. In, in his um, book, Triumph of the City, Edward Glazer claims that urban areas are more productive, more energy efficient, have higher GDP and are happier, happier than corresponding non-urban areas. Why are people fearful of urbanisation? Um, I think that there are a mix of reasons and a mix of motives. Um, in the best cases, uh, there might be uh, a lack of information about the benefits of cities, the benefits of allowing people to move where they need to move in order to take advantage of economic opportunities. Uh, in the worst cases, there's a cynical, uh, cynical, selfish attempts to keep people where they are um, in order to protect vested interests. So there's a whole range of motives, but I think that uh, increasingly uh, governments are being advised by agencies like the World Bank and other uh, voices from academia and from the non-government sector that that sort of fear of urbanization is misplaced and that the, that energy and those efforts can be better utilized to make urban areas better urban areas. Do you think people should be encouraged to move away from rural areas or rural areas should receive less support? Absolutely not. I think uh, people will vote with their feet. Uh, people will go where they need to go in order to exploit economic opportunities and to make the best of their human capital endowments. It was ever thus. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the, the problem is attempts, either explicit or implicit policy attempts, to keep people where they are, in their places of origin. Now, the best possible movement is the movement of people uh, in chase of economic opportunities. The worst possible movement is when people are running away of lack of services in rural areas. So the recipe that we advocate very strongly in the World Development Report 2009 and in reports since is that you have to ensure that there are adequate schools, adequate health facilities, good rural roads, um, outreach to increase the productivity of farming so that when people are, lit, are, are walking away from, from rural areas, they're doing so not in the pursuit of better services, but equipped to jump in to the agglomerations that are happening in urban areas. Simon, in development terms, how much of there is a focus, how much focus is there on the urban poor in the Pacific? Um, I think up to date, not a lot. Um, I think, like Truman's alluded to, I think the, the report in 2009 from the bank was very instructive for development agencies about how the shift was taking place, and particularly in the Pacific. I think it had long been held that it was still a very rural, very subsistence uh, environment, and I think the report showed that that very much was not the case. Um, also, the transformation has been occurring quite rapidly and I think organisations uh, across the world, I mean Truman mentioned it before about World Bank, I think AusAid and other donors are the same, um, sort of struggling a bit to catch up with, with that change despite the fact that it has been a trend now for decades uh, including in the Pacific. So um, I, I think the other dimension that, that brings urbanisation to the fore a little bit now is that um, development agencies tend to have a focus on poverty and poverty reduction and where poverty is occurring now is changing a bit as this change between rural dwelling and urban dwelling is occurring. So I think the report, uh, along with a range of other analytical work that's now starting to take place under this sort of a greater understanding about the urban dimensions, um, will start to see a shift in how we approach the idea of urbanisation but also then how that flows through to what we program and how we deliver different programs, how we have the discussions with different partner countries about the idea of urbanisation. Um, I think that's something we might talk a little bit more about later is that it's, it's one thing for us sitting here in the capital cities to be talking about um, urbanisation in the Pacific or in, in the partner countries where we work but a lot of it is really dependent on, on those voices coming from the countries themselves and, and conceptualising urbanisation, what it means for them mm. um, and bringing that to the table as well. So it's sort of how the two parties meet will really decide about what we end up doing in that space. Do people, generally speaking, do people in um, city or town centres in the Pacific identify as urban dwellers, <coughs> do you think? I think that's a big part of the, the challenge. Um, particularly in the Pacific, if I could, if I could generalise. Um, I think people have a very strong connection with where they're from, where the family is from. Family is obviously a much broader concept than we might have, say, in, in Australia. Um, and I think that's one of those issues where people don't often identify themselves as an, as an urban dweller. And that matters when it comes to holding governments or other bodies to account. Um, if you don't feel yourself of a particular place, then what's happening in that place is, is not really of your concern. Um, and I think the, a lot of the urban areas suffer from that. Um, people still feel very connected to their home area. They might not have lived there for two or three generations. Their entire family and their future generations will live in the urban area. But when asked, where are you from, they'll still refer to an island or another province in the country that's not that urban area. So. Uh, I think there's a lot to be done really about uh, identity and, and how being an urban dweller is seen in the cultural psyche of a, of a particular country. What about people who come and go? How much is there a culture of the, the, the mobile sort of urban dweller who, who straddles the two? Well, I think, the, I think that's a really interesting feature of the Pacific. It's a very mobile place. Um, at the moment I, I work in uh, Vanuatu. And, and it's an extremely cosmopolitan country. Um, it's often 
talked about you know one of the most linguistically diverse countries on earth um, and as a result when people are coming into contact with each other they're they're in effect coming into contact with different cultures um, and an urban place is generally a more cosmopolitan place and so p people are very comfortable with that moving between different cultures but also also means the different physical areas and so for any given family unit there will almost always be someone who's residing in the rural area and also in the urban area so people diversify where they are um, a lot of that particularly in the Pacific is is a way of minimizing the risk um, to the family or the household um, cyclones <coughs> earthquakes, droughts, um, all those sorts of things mean that life can be very precarious if you're just in one remote location and so often as an insurance or a way of um, ensuring that there is another place to move to there's usually one or more family members um, usually reside in an urban environment so it's a very urban places are very important to the resilience of, of households um, and I think some of those things are not really talked about too much uh, at the moment and I think those are the sorts of things that are very positive features of the Pacific and a very positive way about how people engage with the the urban rural um, connection um, that could that could maybe be brought out a little bit more to change the perception of urban dwelling into a more positive feature of, of Pacific life rather than slums and all of the other things that people tend to have connotations with. Do you think it, people should be encouraged to urbanise or to move to urban centres? Oh, I think it's like Truman mentioned before, I don't, I don't think it needs encouragement. Uh, it's, a, it's a very established trend including in the Pacific. Um, so it's more a reality that, that we have, uh, which I guess is why it's very important for us to be talking about it today, um, because it's, it's a re reality that's been in place for quite a long time now. But we've still probably been um, a little bit slow to really pick up on the, the overwhelming positives that this can bring and, and really grasping it as a mainstream issue. So yeah, I don't, I don't know that they need any more encouragement. Yeah, yeah. John, could you um, paint a picture of the diverse experiences of urbanisation across the Pacific? Because in all discussions of the Pacific, it's not one mass, but can you give us a bit of a from here to there? I think it's very interesting that when we, uh, when we think about urbanisation as, as a big issue, we tend to think about places like Shanghai or Bangkok or uh, Mexico City, and we don't think about the Pacific in those terms. We think about the Pacific as, as a place of small islands and, and villages. Um, but in fact, it is urbanised almost as fast as many other parts of the world. <clears throat> so that if you take out Papua New Guinea, 50% of the population of, of the Pacific now lives in urban areas. But there's a big difference, I think, in the, between the Pacific um, and some other parts of the world. But there are also variations within the Pacific. So in Melanesia, for example, where international migration opportunities are relatively limited, uh, urban areas and cities are growing extremely fast. Um, by contrast, in Polynesia and Micronesia, the smaller island states where migration to countries like New Zealand and the United States is much more common, the towns there are, are much more stable, growing relatively slowly, and perhaps management is a little bit easier. But it's particularly, I think, in, in the countries of Melanesia and some other places like Kiribati, where urbanization is also quite rapid, where some of the problems are beginning, or indeed not just beginning, but have already emerged, of generating employment, of providing adequate services like housing and so on. Can you tell us about Tarawa as an as a example mm. of uh, various problems, but also the overwhelming shift to an urban area? Okay, Tarawa is the, the capital of Kiribati. Kiribati has a population of roughly 100,000, spread over something like 18 populated coral atolls. Um, presently, there's been a very substantial migration over, since independence in the 1970s to South Tower, the capital city. So something like 35% of the population now live there. So about 35,000 people live on a tiny fragment of one particular coral atoll. Is that uh, the density of Hong Kong? Population same density, oh. slightly more than Hong Kong, uh, which you can imagine the pressures that, that that place is on a small island for things like water supplies, for sewerage, for employment for housing and so on. So very intense pressures. And alongside that is the fact that this is a coral atoll. 
Mm. The highest point is two meters above sea level. So it's, the potential for flooding is considerable, let alone the long-term potential for sea level rise. So Tarawa faces some of the most difficult urbanization problems in the region. Why do people move there? For the same reasons as they do in most other places. Some people talk about it as the three E's, employment, education, and entertainment. Um, I sat in Kiribati many years ago in Tarawa, and I asked this guy why he'd come to town. He said, we don't have any vehicles on our island. I wanted to see a car. Oh, well, that, <laughs> that was 20 years ago, and things have changed a bit. Um, but many of the outer islands are very, very poor. The chance of good employment is there in the centre, good education is there in the centre. So there's a massive desire for those kinds of services. And part of the difficulty in Kiribati and indeed most parts of the Pacific is extending those services to archipelagos, to fragmented island states, getting good services out to rural areas um, rather than having them concentrated in the urban centres. Mm -hmm. So, and, and not everyone gets the three E's when they get there, I suppose, but what, what are some of the challenges they face once they move there? Well, the principal challenge is, is employment. Um, in Kiribati, for example, most of the good employment in the bureaucracy, the private sector is, is relatively poorly developed and there's no obvious uh, potential for that. So many of the people who move, move in with families, move in with kin, um, and hopefully gain some of the income that those people have. Equally, it's, it's not always easy to gain access to education and indeed to services. So I think Tara is an extreme case, but in most parts of the Pacific, access to employment and to adequate services is a difficult issue. Mm. Max, could you describe the cities that are growing in Papua New Guinea, what they look like? Like, draw, draw a picture for people who haven't been there. First of all, before I answer that question, I'd like to thank uh, Praxis and this program for bringing me here. Thank you uh, this, this is an issue that I've been trying to bring to the uh, attention of uh, uh, the nation. Uh, PNG has been urbanizing for a while since colonial days, and um, uh, but still. Uh, the critical mass of people, the politicians, the the politicians, the um, uh, mainstream bureaucracy, we still find it uh, difficult to talk about urbanization. Uh, even though the cities have been growing uh, at a very fast rate, uh, 1966 we had uh, about 100,000 people in towns and cities. Now we have a million in the towns and cities and the question is if there if we have a million now and Port Moresby is growing at about 4.5 to 5 percent and Ley is also growing very fast and some of the other towns and cities are growing very fast uh, growing very fast because people are coming to towns and cities and they're not coming to towns and cities because there is work they're coming because they want to come into towns and cities the country uh, guarantees their freedom of movement. They have the, the right to move anywhere they want to go. And uh, people now have uh, the mobile phones. Market was for 150,000. Now they say uh, there's 1.5 or 2 million mobile phones uh, in all of the rural areas. And they're seeing what's happening in the world all around them. They have access to uh, Facebook and YouTube and you name it. And so they want to be part of that. And it's encouraging and uh, uh, putting a force on people to move into towns and cities whether there's something good or not because they think that's where it all happens. So what we uh, have been trying to do is say here we have a reality but we haven't planned for it. We haven't planned for it 10 years ago. Ten years ago, somebody raised it on the floor of parliament, and they shouted it down. What are you talking about? We are about rural. That's where the majority are. Why, why isn't it getting the focus when there's such an overwhelming demand? Well, it's, I think, to do with custom. It's the way people have been made to think. Uh, they thought that towns and cities are temporary places where you just come in, do your work, and go back to the village. But more and more, nobody's going back to the village because... There's nothing to go back to. The people who came to work in towns and cities are staying back in the towns and cities because uh, uh, they probably lost their rights to land 
other people, because of the long absences, uh, may have taken their, uh, the land that should have be belonged to them. Mm -hmm. So once you try to go back to the village, to your land, uh, they will see you as a stranger and you have nothing, and you haven't practiced living in the village. So this urban thing and the urbanization, it's, uh, it's here, uh, and it's not about town development. When we talk about urban, urban is a change of culture. It's a way of life. So in PNG, what we talk about urbanization, it's not about developing the towns and cities. It's about transforming. It's about transformation of a way of life and our, our people. So it's much bigger than just urban development per se, developing towns and cities. What, what's, the, what's the need in the cities at the moment? Like how, how dire is the situation of slums and services or mm -hmm. lack of infrastructure? Can you describe, say, in Port Moresby or some other towns, mm -hmm. some other cities, what, how people are living without the support? Yeah, because we haven't been talking about urban and we haven't been planning uh, town and urban expansion and urban development, uh, the growth that I've talked about is all in the informal on the fringes, ad hoc developments. So Port Mosby, in from, uh, Port Mosby lay many of the towns and cities. The dominant feature now is informal settlements. Uh, housing hasn't been developed properly, land hasn't been developed properly, so physical planning hasn't gone into the towns and cities. And so eventually, and before we know it, if we keep going that way, we're going to end up with slum conditions. That's why I've been telling uh, my colleagues, uh, the government, the people, and the donors, uh, including OSAID and World Bank, that you know we need to start uh, to work together to address uh, urbanization as one of the most dominant, forceful, and dynamic things that are happening to the people of Pacific, uh, to the Melanesian people especially, the land sizes are not growing. We have land tenure system where customer land ownership is very valued. And they own 97%. So how do you go outside the boundaries of the 3% town boundaries? Those are big challenges when so many people are moving into towns and cities so quickly. Mm. Simon, would you like to talk about the role of um, urban governance a little bit and how yeah. that comes into play? Yeah, I mean, I think Max's points are really good ones, and I think that's one of the challenges for uh, development partners or, or donors to to work on this issue. Is that um, we work at the invitation of countries. Um, if countries are telling us that it's health or education or, or some other issue, that's they're the issues that we'll typically engage with. Um, Urbanisation is a tricky one in that um, we can see that it's an issue. Um, that, that dealt with proactively could be a real positive for development. Uh, ignored could become a big problem. Um, but it's really about trying to, to meet halfway between, um, I guess, raising the issue from the outside, but also um, supporting those trying to raise the issue from the inside, from the countries themselves and how they join together. The, the difficulty is, I think, with urbanisation is that it's a very fragmented space. There's not really obvious entry points for anyone to, to coordinate the discussion. Uh, if it's education, you go and talk to the Ministry of Education. If it's health, the Ministry of Health. If it's traditionally rural development, you might go and talk to the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. There might be a place. Urbanisation doesn't really have that. Um, even just taking the case of, of um, Port Vila, and it won't be that different to most other places in the Pacific, you'll have the municipality, which tends to be very poorly resourced. Uh, then you'll have the provincial government that sits over the top of that, which will often have as much of the urban population in its boundaries as the municipality, because the peri-urban areas are where it's really growing. You'll have a national planning department, maybe. You might have a lands department who has a, s a separate responsibility. Then you have all the cultural organisations, so that the, the, the way that the traditional systems have been migrated to the urban environment. They'll also be very different depending on what area. So 
trying to find a coherent or a coordinated way to have the discussion that's needed to happen to elevate it to the national level like Max said, it's really tough in the urban environment. So I guess that's something for today's discussion is, um, you know, sort of how do we start to really uh, ramp up that engagement and a lot of that's going to really come back to the, the with who. We, we tried to jump into that vacuum um, by producing documents like the World Development Report and a lot of country specific and region specific work that was tied to this report reshaping economic geography. Um, even if that entry point never materializes explicitly in the form of a ministry or in the form of a request from a minister, um, we found it helpful in dialogue with countries to gauge what the general orientation of the development discussion is. Is the general orientation of the development discussion one that romanticizes rural life, that somehow demonizes urbanization, that is so focused on the plight of people in slums as to lose sight of the benefits of urban agglomerations? Or is it one that is a little bit more neutral to where people are living, neutral to place, so that you can approach with policy recommendations that are similarly place neutral um, to not get in the way of people who want to move, but to make sure that the people who uh, stay behind or the people before they move have adequate schooling, have adequate health care, um, are able to get their farm goods to market through uh, good functioning rural roads. Um, I think somewhat cynically sometimes uh, policymakers and even some interest groups outside of government present this uh, discussion of urbanization in a dichotomy. So if you're for urban it automatically means you're against rural and that's a false dichotomy. Good urbanization <coughs> means good schools in rural areas. Good urbanization means adequate health care in rural areas. Good urbanization means increasing the productivity of farm uh, labor so that hands are freed and bodies are freed to move into urban areas to become part of a different sort of economy. Um, so it's a comprehensive approach that's needed. Um, and even if the explicit entry point in the form of an invitation from government doesn't exist, I think that it behooves those of us who um, are producing knowledge and have access to knowledge to, to be suggestive and to find the orientation, find the entry points and exploit them. One, one, um, one point about that is that uh, there is uh, already a culture of expectation. The donor agencies expect the countries to ask for health and education law and order. And the countries think that that's what the donors want. So it's just communicating health, education, law and order, health, education, law and order forever. Without realizing that the urban condition situations that we are living in, we are part of it. We breathe it. We live it. And, but you are oblivious of what's happening and want to continue to think that it's not there. And at uh, uh, what point in time there will be a time when it's going to be too late. That's the issue. We need to start planning. Uh, it's about a, uh, a, ca a country and a nation that's trying to catch up with everybody else who have urbanized. So, Max, what, what do you see that needs to happen now? What's the most urgent yeah. thing? The urgent thing that needs to happen now is that uh, donors, countries, they have to buy into the idea that urban is here and it's permanent. It's irreversible. It's a bigger feature and a dominant part of our effort to develop and change and modernize. Yeah? And if you first you recognize that, you appreciate that, and then we're going to change the way do we do business about how we approach development. If the proportion of the people increasingly are going to become urban, and we're going to ask ourselves, 20 or 30 years' time, where will the population be? Obviously not in the rural areas. They will be in the towns and cities. But if we haven't planned for it and we have not managed it and we are not managing it now, then when are we going to manage it? Simon? Oh, sorry, I was just thinking about what Truman said before. As a, as a term, I think, is really powerful, that neutrality of place. 
And I think, if, I think even if we don't get the shift all the way across to urbanisation, I think that the most sensible place to end up is, is more firmly in the middle. And um, I think a lot of what we talked about is uh, rural development has a long history. Um, probably not that successful as an idea either, in that rural development is much more complicated than the idea of rural development. And I think that's been shown to be true in the results that have happened in the rural space. Um, but getting the discussion back to the middle, I think, is what's really needed. So, so for an example, for an organisation like AusAid, where poverty reduction is the focus, it's about making sure that we keep really oriented on that issue. Um, and I think working in an urban environment will naturally come from that. So in the case of Vanuatu, the, the most recent census that came out, the poverty rates are double uh, in the urban areas compared to the rural areas. That's a pretty staggering statistic. Uh, it's not the case in the rest of the Pacific, but in the case of Vanuatu, it is. Why, that, why is that? They have different poverty lines. Um, fortunately for most people in the rural areas, they can meet a lot of their basic needs, not necessarily in terms of services, but certainly in terms of sure. food security. Yeah. Um, in the urban environment, it's very, very difficult. Uh, we've already talked about access to land, yeah. um, access to financial services, overcrowding, all the other difficulties about the current um, urban environment, mm. but people continue to move. Um, in the second city of Luganville, the poverty rates doubled there since the last census. Mm. So people are moving far, far quicker than, than <coughs> formal or informal um, structures can, can support them. Mm. John, what do you think is the, most, the area that needs the most focus? I think it's worth saying um, initially that uh, we tend to think of, of, of urbanisation as an issue of migration. Mm. And it's not only migration. Um, certainly one thing is happening, and that is migrants are becoming more permanent. A big phrase in the Pacific 20 years ago was circular migration. But people are less and less likely to circulate now. They're more likely to stay for themselves and for their children's education, their children's future, and so on. Um, but a second thing is happening, and that is people being born in town. Hmm. Surprise, surprise. Um, and these people have, uh, the people who grow up in town, who are born in town, actually may talk about their home village, but as Max says, when they go back to those home villages, people look at them and say, no, no, sorry, you don't belong. And so there's no rural safety net for those people. They have an urban future, and we have to think about that, that urban future. Hmm. And as, as we're increasingly seeing now in the Pacific, we used to use this nice weasel word hardship until a few years ago. And now we actually are brave enough to say poverty because poverty is much more visible. Mm -hmm. And we do need to think about urban residents because um, poverty is certainly there in many rural areas and it's certainly there in large parts, uh, uh, some parts of urban, of urban areas as well. So I think what we need is a greater focus on urban planning. We certainly need very basically some land use plans in cities and we need to move, to, I think, towards a more just and equitable city um, where we think about the poor and don't marginalise the informal sector. There are too many places where uh, people who are market sellers are victimised by, by municipal governments and so on. And <clears throat> hopefully um, cities can indeed become spaces of hope. Mm. Truman, do you think it's possible to achieve sustainable uh, urban development in the Pacific? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I have never been to Six Mile or Nine Mile or Kipo or Vada Vada um, yet. Uh, that will come. But I've been to lots of um, urban settlements, informal settlements in East Africa and South America. And it's easy to go there and to despair and to say, this is hell on earth. But then if you take a second look, a closer careful look, you uh, see uh, this very exciting entrepreneurial energy mm -hmm. going on. Uh, that energy needs to be captured, it needs to be facilitated, it needs to be nurtured, and probably the most important thing that governments can do is to sort out land markets. Um, we've talked about urban planning, and urban planning is certainly very important, but you know, the transaction of land mm -hmm. is very important. Sorting out tenure for people who have lived on land, even for generations. Mm -hmm. Um, and making sure that land markets function properly. Um, and I don't know about this part of the world yet, but in East Africa and Latin America, there's a lot of people in power who are very, very cynically preventing um, the, the functioning, the good functioning of land markets. Land mar when land markets function well, cities function well. Um, and that's a, a, a real key to turning these places into places of prosperity, prosperity for all people, mm -hmm. even people in slums. 
I think we'll open up to questions now. Thank you all. Um, we have a question here uh, from Port Moresby for Max. What are the Papua New Guinea government's plans to address serious housing problems where prices of rentals have increased dramatically, forcing many to live in settlements? Yeah. Uh, when you talk about urbanisation, urbanisation is uh, very uh, cross-cutting in many areas. It's housing, it's land development, it's environment, it's planning, uh, it's law and order, it's social issues. Everything is in urbanisation. You put everything about development into it and it's all there. So um, housing prices in Port Mosby uh, are ridiculously high. Yeah, they're even higher than New York or some of the uh, most expensive places on earth. It's because of this urbanization. We haven't been planning urbanization for a long time. We haven't doing, been doing land development for a long time. So things are happening on their own. That's the point. We need to manage, we need to look at urbanization in a holistic way. You cannot deal with just uh, housing. You have to think about uh, a strategy, a national strategy, uh, a national policy, put them in place, talk about the land use, okay? Talk about the land use and how you're going to locate your population. And then you talk about the city specific plans like land development. Nobody has been doing site and service. So you might have the money to build your house, but if there's no block of land with the water and sewage and power and all the necessary services, how do you build your house? Private sector does it. They recover their cost and they add it on, and then they put 300000 for land value, another 300000 for the house. It's 600000 So what kind of ordinary Papua New Guinean public servant can afford that kind of uh, money? So how do we want to deal with this is through the uh, national urbanization policy, we are saying that let's do large scale site and service on state land, of existing state land, or on the customary land. Then we can uh, you know, bring down at least the land development cost down and people can build on it. We are experimenting with doing some land development but like I say, you have to have the government will to put the money and resources to develop plenty of land. And then you can bring the uh, bubble, the housing price bubble down, make it more affordable. Port Vila, which you know, is a completely different scale, uh, still has the same issue. And uh, recently there was a report that came out that between 30 and 35 percent of middle income dwellers are living in informal settlements only due to the fact that there's no land available. Mm -hmm. These are people that can afford to move, like, like Max said. It's just there's no land available. So you have people squatting <laughs> who, can, who can actually afford to not do it. Um, and that's, that's a huge percentage of the population that you could be immediately taking out of this more risky, more insecure environment uh, just by freeing up what, land markets. So Max, you're working now at developing policy to address these things. How how long do you think until some of these changes might be taken up, until it might actually trickle we, down? We're not thinking about uh, developing policy. We have done a national urbanisation policy. Okay. has been approved in uh, 2010, was launched in May this year, and uh, in a week's time we are uh, trying to hold a national urban forum, bringing uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet Ministers, MPs, uh, high-level bureaucrats and private sector to say, let's talk about the urbanization issue. Is it real or not? Do we want to change or do we keep going the same direction that we are going? And we've got to make a decision as to whether we stop and really do something serious to change our urban future. If we just keep going the same way we are going, definitely we are going to end up having slums for cities. And the housing problems will continue. Many of the public servants now live in squatter settlements, informal settlements, for lack of uh, the need for uh, lack of housing. Uh, the housing commission had stopped building affordable houses because of uh, other issues and problems. Uh, and uh, we have a big housing problem. But as you cannot just deal with the housing. We have to deal with the whole in a systematic 
and uh, holistic approach. Um, my name is Gerard. I'm from uh, an NGO called Tech Change. Um, my question is basically about the politics of service delivery within the Pacific and how urbanisation has affected sort of mobilisation networks. So sort of how, whether urbanisation has affected who participates in politics and particularly how Max was talking about the dissemination of mobile telephony across the Pacific. How has that affected sort of, you know, urban to rural uh, mobilisation and how that's pressured, you know, perhaps improved service delivery or whether it's, you know, how, how it's impacted um, political dynamics across the Pacific and p particularly PNG? I, th I think what it's done is it's, um, is it certainly raised expectations uh, in the urban areas. Um, I think the difficulty then comes back to some of the governance arrangements that exist there. And I don't mean government, I mean governance. Like, uh, that's, in, that's informal and traditional as well as the formal structures. Um, they're just not very well resourced, resourced to deal with it. I mean, you know, service delivery is a, a classic one. You know, you, lots of people there, lots of people can see it, lots of people are mobilising, talking. It's obviously a closer space. People tend to be more educated. Um, but you're dealing with a municipality who has virtually no capacity to do anything. The next level of government might be provincial. They've got many other issues to deal with, so they're not dealing with it either. Um, the national government, as a consequence, is sort of just saying it's not, it's not my business, it's someone else's business. So it, what it does throw up is some innovative solutions to it. I think you are starting to see some more creative solutions um, through um, like chief systems or other, other levels of new urban organisation, um, NGOs are starting to step in and do it. The private sector is doing a lot of it now as well. Um, again, going back to the case of Port Vila, you know, if you don't live in the municipality, you get your garbage collected, but it's by a private contractor and it all works fine. If you step over into the municipal boundary, maybe not so good. Um, so <laughs> I'll be, I'll be diplomatic here. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I, th I mean, there are solutions coming forward. I guess a lot of it is about, you know, how do you take it to that next level rather than just a series of ad hoc responses. I think the mobile telephony has had the biggest impact in rural areas, essentially, mm -hmm. and particularly enabling people to have better access to services so they know when services will be delivered. Mm -hmm. They know when boats will come or when planes will come. So that's, that's much more effective. Um, the big change is probably still to come or is still emerging in some place, and that is access to money through mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And that's already happening in Samoa and Fiji, in Papua New Guinea as well. Mm -hmm. That's going to make a very big change. I've got a question here from uh, Haniara, um, in, and this is, I think, maybe John, you can talk to this a bit. In the Solomon Islands, the scale is not balanced, meaning negative impacts of urbanisation are far greater than positive impacts. How can island states like Solomon Islands strike a balance or avoid the negative effects of urbanisation? Mm. That's, uh, that's, to me, almost a million dollar question because I think we always, we always go a million keener question, million whatever, paanga <laughs> question, because um, we always go back to this notion that how do you create employment because the bottom line is employment. That's the first reason that, well, along with education, that most people move to urban areas. That's mm -hmm. what they want. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to generate adequate employment for, for those people who are moving to urban areas? Mm -hmm. And indeed, those people who are growing up in urban areas. And I think it's extremely difficult. Truman has talked about uh, the migrants with their get-up-and-go attitude and, and their ability to be entrepreneurs. Now, a lot of microcredit has gone into to supporting such people. Remittances have gone into supporting small entrepreneurs as well. But getting small entrepreneurs to be big entrepreneurs Entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in small Pacific Islands is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so often the, the real centres of employment and economic growth are where mining exists. And there are some prospects outside Papua New Guinea for mining, but it, it's very difficult to see exactly where uh, cities like Honiara and to a lesser extent Port Vila will create the employment opportunities in the future. We've got a line of uh, analytical work here at the World Bank called Pacific Futures. Uh, and it's in many ways um, inspired by our work in uh, economic geography. And what it tries to do is to um, present more realistic expectations of what are going to be the drivers of growth and job creation in small island states. Mm -hmm. Now, you can argue which, you know, which small islands really fit into the category of Pacific futures that, we're, that we are typologizing, but basically it's uh, pl small places that are distant from markets with low population density um, 
and with a lot of diversity and division within them. All of those things conspire against uh, private sector-led economic growth. Uh, and in many ways, it's caused us at the World Bank to uh, recalibrate our expectations and definitions of what de development will mean in many of the countries in this corner of the world. Development will mean not a vibrant private sector that's creating jobs. Development will mean uh, government services or social services that are being provided and increasing people's welfare. Now, in that is an enormous, uh, an enormous potential for job creation. Uh, that's not to say it's going to provide all people with jobs, and it's not going to provide all people with jobs in urban areas. Uh, but it is to say that we have to calibrate our expectations of where, what we can realistically expect uh, of these island states so challenged by geography, uh, even with the perfect policies. And I say even with the perfect policies because there's a lot of housekeeping to do. There's a lot of housekeeping to do. In the labor code, in the business environment regulations, in the uh, uh, regulations that control how it or determine how attractive a, a small island state is to foreign direct investment. I mean, there's a lot of housekeeping to do, and once we do that housekeeping, we might be able to see at the margin some more job creation than we have seen in the past. Uh, none of these are arguments for pe keeping people in rural areas. None of them. They're all arguments for making cities work better. I think it also explains why the fastest growing Pacific Islander cities are actually Auckland and Honolulu and Sydney. Mm. As people, mm. uh, people from rural Samoa bypass Apia, people from rural Tonga bypass Nukualofa because the opportunities are relatively few. Urbanization is happening, but a long way away from the islands. Yeah. I get the really good point. You know that, that if you take the case of those countries that that are able to migrate externally a lot easier. That is, that is where the urban experience happens. It happens in another metropolitan centre. I've been in Melanesia, it happens internally. And so that's where you can see this real difference between the urban experience uh, between those two parts of the Pacific. And Melanesia obviously has a lot more to grapple with internally uh, as a result. Catherine, I uh, work at the World Bank here. Yeah. I'm just interested in perceptions of how welcome, I guess, people from the rural areas are into the urban environment um, and whether uh, not only the land issues, obviously they, they won't have access to customary land, but just the identity, obviously, um, much more than in Australia where people move from anywhere in the rural areas in Australia. We can't tell by looking at them where they're, where they're from. That's not in our custom tradition. But in the Pacific, often people can look at you and, and identify where you might be from, which island in particular, and whether that affects the, the welcomeness and that identity as part of that urban environment. OK. Um, PNG is uh, quite a diverse uh, country. Uh, they say Vanuatu has uh, plenty of languages, but PNG has 826 languages, complete. Uh, so that makes it a very diverse place. And uh, we are, uh, you know, like adjusting, uh, graveling to adjust and make this new, more modern, uh, truly Papua New Guinea society, a mix of everybody. Uh, the, the good thing is that there is no dominant uh, culture or dominant group. So uh, the living together in the towns and cities are okay. Uh, and uh, we've managed to uh, come this way after 36, 37 years. Uh, many people think that uh, maybe we're going to go down anarchy and chaos and bloodbath and, you know, total disintegration. But, uh, you know, we haven't, not just yet. Uh, all this, <laughs> despite, uh, you know, we had two prime ministers at one time and two commanders and two police, whatever. But we say, well, you guys sort it out there and we the people are going to continue to, with life as usual. It's because people see that they are not really interested in those big political issues, but for the day-to-day -day survival and living and all that is more important to them. I'd like to just move on to a few questions mm. we've got from um, mm. the video link. There is uh, from Timor-Leste, uh, Olivio Dos Santos from the World Bank. 
um, has a question for Truman or John. What would, the, what would be the best solution for Timor-Leste to tackle the issue of overflowing people to the capital without restricting their rights to having access to economic opportunities and better educations, etc.? Dili is not capable of handling this flow. Rural, rural development. Rural development. Mm -hmm. Draw people back to the rural areas. Yeah, I mean, uh, why do people migrate? For education, for employment. If you can generate those things in rural areas, most people will stay. That's where their source of security is, their land, their home, their kinship groups, their cultures. Um, but they need services. They need income, income sources. If those things exist in rural areas, migration will be more manageable. People move uh, for a, very, a variety of reasons. There are as many reasons for people migrating as there are migrants. Um, migration is probably almost always uh, better for the person who's moving. The question is, how do you make it better for society as a whole? How do you make it uh, a, a contributory factor to <coughs> agglomeration and to the general increase of welfare? And so, as a po putting yourself in the, in the position of a policymaker, you want people to move because of economic opportunity, whether they're moving from rural areas to cities or cities to rural areas or between rural areas, something that's happening far more frequently. You don't want to have them moving, escaping violence. You don't want them to be moving uh, in search of adequate education. You don't want them to be moving in search of adequate health attention. Um, and I'm afraid in Timor-Leste, um, there's a lot to be done in ensuring adequate education and adequate health in rural places. Now, you know, until we go and we interview every person in the slum communities around Dili, we won't know to what extent people have moved because they're trying to seek basic services, services that they're entitled to as citizens. But I bet that many of them are there for that reason. And if they're there for that reason, then they're adding to the congestion. They're not adding to the agglomeration. And so the agenda is very, very clear. Putting adequate services in outlying areas. Yeah, um, I think it's about trying to uh, develop uh, you know, a hierarchy of cities. Instead of one daily, they can think about developing another major center somewhere strategically located in population areas. So, you know, if you just talk about rural development, we're going back to this, uh, like, develop the rural, send them back to the rural areas. We don't want that. We're talking about strategizing the country to develop major cities and major towns in strategic locations around the country so they can stay there instead of all migrating to Port Mosby or Delhi. So that's the approach that we are trying to uh, tell government that if urbanization is here and we're going to be here for the long haul, we're going to have to decide some big cities strategically located, uh, geographically located around the country and work towards building up those cities so that we don't have one crowded city. Very much supportive of what Max is saying is back to the point that I was trying to make earlier about place neutrality of policy. Governments are really, really bad at choosing winning industries. They're equally as bad at identifying what the future likely places of uh, urban prosperity are going to be. Now, that's only a problem if the policies that they wield, the tools at their disposal, um, are very place specific. But if they ge sort of generally approach place, the regulation of land markets, the provision of services, the maintenance of, uh, of law and order, neutrally ensuring that every place, not only the prosperous urban centers, but the outlying economically lagging areas benefit from those common institutions, then wherever an urban agglomeration chances to spring up, you're ready for it. Yeah. Are there any more questions from the room? Uh, Kirk Huffman, I'm the honorary curator of the Vanuatu Culture Center on the scientific committee of the museum in Tahiti. Research Associate at the Australian Museum. Simon, I liked your stuff. He's right. And Lapun, thank you, Tomas. But uh, uh, look, for example, in Vanuatu, the, really, the only place where you get real poverty is in the capital. The recent uh, report released called Alternative Indicators of Well-Being, which has been done in Vanuatu, analyzing the whole country from different aspects, but also done by an economist, coordinated by an economist, from Johns Hopkins University, it was released from the Vanuatu Statistics Office, has shown that the province in Vanuatu that is the most distant 
is the small is the is the most remote in inverted commas that has the least modern services and stuff like that that's right up in the Tories is the area where social contentment social cohesion happiness is the highest and there's no money up there World Bank always makes the mistake of thinking everything is about jobs and about money it's a very serious mistake because look what the economists have led the whole world into boom over a cliff I have friends in Greece relatives in Spain people there now are talking about we made a real mistake overemphasizing urbanization now I know we can't stop urbanization but we have to be very careful about it it is extremely dangerous because it is not sustainable we've got climate change everything coming in and you have to be really really cautious about it don't over promote it John what you said get them back to the land in Timor-Leste that's the safest thing that's what a lot of people are saying in Spain the mistake we made was going off the land you know okay Simon, could you talk to that a bit? It, do you think there is too much focus? Would it be better if people were encouraged to go, say in Vanuatu in particular, go to the far reaches, become more subsistent? Uh, uh, no. Um, no, I mean, I think that's a lot of what we've been talking about here today. Uh, people aren't making these decisions because they've been encouraged. In fact, people are making these decisions often actively Sorry. being discouraged. <laughs> They're still doing it. Um, so I don't think, e even if we all jumped up tomorrow and every government jumped up tomorrow and said, don't do it, I don't think, it w well, history would show it wouldn't make any difference anyway. It, um, it's happening organically. So it's about, again, we've already mentioned a few times this term neutrality of place. It's just looking at what we have, taking off some of the blinkers that we have and taking off some of the blinkers that we have or the prejudices we have against urbanisation and just being a bit more dispassionate and neutral ourselves about looking at, you know, if our mandate is economic growth or our mandate is poverty reduction or whatever it might be, just looking at it um, a bit more dispassionately. And I think that will just naturally throw up that we do have a big blind spot in a way um, for urbanisation and what we're dealing with. I mean, 70% of GDP on average is generated out of these areas. So you're typically talking about, you know, less than half of 1% of a land area will be three quarters of your economy is coming from there. Now, whether you're a believer of economic growth trickling down or all that helping poverty, um, I, I don't think it matters too much. I think we know that growth is important to poverty reduction and growth is occurring in urban areas, so we're going to have to do something in that space. Would you like to respond to, the, to Kirk's point about the focus always being on jobs growth and... Um, I think, uh, look, we, we got to take a clue at what people are doing uh, themselves. You know, people are moving. And this is not new. People have always moved. My dad moved from a failing farm in rural Wisconsin to Chicago to drive a cab for 20 years. Um, and, you know, our family was ever more better off for it. Um, and similarly, people all around the world, in spite of whatever government is trying to to tell them in spite of whatever limits that governments are, are mistakenly uh, putting in, in their place, they're moving and they don't have to be economists to know that they're better off. They just have to be uh, rational human beings. Now, uh, yes, you could mistakenly romanticize urban urbanization and romanticize cities, um, but you know, in the past we've mistakenly and to a lot of cost and to a lot of foregone poverty alleviation, romanticized rural areas. And the point is to be place neutral because policy is a very powerful thing. And I would never want to be part of any operation that was supporting policies that told people where to be. Uh, movement is a human right. And so we need to take a clue from the decisions that people are making. And the decisions that are people are making is to be in rural areas, to be a part of the prosperity that that brings. <laughs> <laughs> just, just quickly on that. Yes. Something that uh, someone was pointing out to me just a few weeks ago is that unlike migrations previously, uh, and let's say specifically in the Pacific, people are doing it in a much more informed way now. With, with the access to telecommunications, for example, people aren't going into these spaces naively, like, oh, there's some bright lights, I saw it on a television program. They have friends, relatives, I mean, they, are, they know very much what they're getting in for. So. People are doing it in a much more informed way. So I think we need to be conscious of that. This is not something that we need to be protecting people from. They are making more informed choices about this decision now than they ever have before. 
I think that's all we've got time for today. But um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. If you'd like to look at past episodes of Praxis, please go to our website, which is www.worldbank.org forward slash Praxis. And please join me in thanking our panellists, Truman Packard, John Connell, Simon Cramp and Max Kep.